Matthew chapter 16. I want to read in your hearing from verse 20. Matthew chapter 16 from verse 20. Then charged he his disciples that they should tell no man that he was Jesus the Messiah or the Christ. From that time forth, began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go into Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and the chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised again the third day. Then Peter took him and began to rebuke him, saying, Be it far from thee, Lord, this shall not be unto thee. But he turned and said unto Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan, O Satan. Thou art an offense unto me, for thou savorest not the things that be of God, but those that be of men. Then said Jesus unto his disciples, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it, and whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. It is against this backdrop that I've captioned the message, the long-awaited Messiah, but the unexpected Savior. The long-awaited Messiah, but the unexpected Savior. Let us pray, Father. You birthed this message into me just maybe a few hours ago. Uh, I believe it's a message that is necessary even as the world gets ready to do what they always do around this time. I pray that you will elevate our minds from the things of this earth so that we can set our minds on things that are above. For all that is down here will soon melt away with fervent heat. Well, what you relish and what you cherish are things that shall not and cannot be shaken. So, Lord, reinvigorate our faith today, even as we listen to your word. And may the words that are spoken do that which they were intended to do, so that nobody would leave here without hearing what the Spirit says to his or her heart is my prayer in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Putting pieces of a puzzle together can be a very taxing experience. Those of you who perhaps still engage in this pastime, you know that getting pieces of puzzles together, depending on how many pieces there might be, can be a frustrating experience. Some of you don't have the patience and some of you give up quite easily. I remember when I was much younger, a relative of ours gave all the five boys a gift during this time of the year. It was a gift of, I think it could be 10,000 pieces to put together. Five to 10,000, I can't remember the exact figure. We took maybe five to six months to put it together. We had it on the table and we spread it out so ensuring that it will be big enough to fit or the table was big enough to accommodate the final product. And ever so often during the daytime, we will come by and we will try to put the pieces together. Of course, the easiest part is to get the edges all fixed up. You know that. Those of you who are into puzzle, you get the edges. Once you get the outward part of it, at least you know how big the puzzle would look like. You get the frame. It's easier with the edges. But the difficult parts come when you have to put together a blue sky or a blue sea or some white background. It's, you, you look at pieces and there were times, many times you saw pieces, you look at it, you look the right shape, the right color, the right size and you try to fit the piece and it's not fitting. It's frustrating as you try to put this piece together and even as you go through this experience and you do so without much success, you are tempted to blame the manufacturer for putting an extra piece that does not belong. 
Maybe I'm talking to myself. This is what I would do. This is what I did. Very often when I couldn't, I saw the piece. I know it looked exactly like the part that was missing. But when I placed it in position, it just would not fit. Frustrating, to say the least. If this describes the frustration you have experienced with putting a puzzle together, then you could begin to appreciate how the disciples would have felt trying to put the pieces of who the Messiah was meant to be together. The profile that they had did not fit into who Jesus is, or Jesus did not fit into the profile that they had. I imagine just like my brothers, they tried repeatedly to put certain aspects of his ministry into the perspective of the Messiah puzzle that they know best. But like my brothers and like myself, the pieces in their mind were not coming together with the person in their presence. It was a frustrating experience and one could begin to understand why their view of the Messiah was misplaced and at times even inaccurate. You see, their view of the Messiah to a great extent depended on the nature of the condition in which they would have found themselves at the time. Stay with me now. Who they looked for to a large degree depended upon what they were looking for. Are you still here with me? In other words, their predicament determined their theology. Mm -hmm. Their predicament determined their theology of who the Messiah is. Let me unpack that and break it down just a little bit. A girl who longs for the culinary skills of her mother when she is hungry will long for the mother, that same mother, to become a nurse when she is sick. She will no longer require the culinary skills of her mother when she is sick because her need determines who her mother ought to be. Are you still here with me? An employee who is accustomed to taking directives and directions from his supervisor will want that same supervisor to give him support and not directives if that employee should lose a loved one. A, a child who longs for commendation when that child has failed, uh, uh, sorry, when a child has succeeded, will want the teacher to be compassionate and encouraging when the same child has failed. Are you still here with me? Our predicament can determine who we want Jesus to be at the time we want him to be. You don't want Jesus to be a provider when it's protection that you want. You don't want him to be a judge when you desire comfort. Who wants a lecture or lecturer or a lecture? Who wants a lecture when you want a listening ear? Who wants a sermon when you are looking for consolation and counseling? Who speaks about forgiveness when you desire vengeance? Who wants a lamb when you're looking for a lion? Who wants a suffering, soft savior when you want a conquering king? Our predicament can determine our theology because of the severity and the magnitude of the oppression they faced from the Romans. These Jews, yeah, these disciples longed for someone who will vanquish their enemy and somehow avenge the injustices that were meted out to them so that their, their nation can be restored to wholeness once again. I ha it had been almost 1,000 years since they had lost their earthly kingdom, since Israel had gone into bankruptcy, if you will. After Solomon's death, Israel plunged into discord and disunity and division and chaos and wickedness and weakness and ultimately captivity. Their riches were gone, their credibility were, was destroyed, and their pride was assassinated. Therefore, they long for someone who will come and resurrect them and resurrect their pride and restore respect and power and prestige to their nation once again. 
So every time, every time I imagine when they saw Jesus perform a miracle, they got excited, not because of what Jesus came to do, not because of the nature of his mission, but they saw his miracles as a pathway to power. Are you still here with me? Oh, whenever they saw him doing something out of the ordinary, they, keep, they kept seeing an earthly king. And they kept thinking, oh, when he is exalted, I know what position I will hold. Let me break it down for you a little more. Every now and again, perhaps even around this time, some stores give out certain vouchers or gifts gifts or packages or they even offer you cars so i just imagine one day sister vilma allen is filling out one of those forms you know when you go to the grocery you fill out the form and and they pick a card at the end of the year or the beginning of the new year and if your card is picked you win a new car you all know that has anybody ever been a recipient of such a gift you're afraid to put up your hand right now i know that uh, but, but let's suppose she would win this SUV that is advertised in one of the popular stores uh, and she's excited. Her husband would be excited for her, but his excitement would be also measured by the fact that he will get to drive it. He is not so much excited for her as he is for excited about sitting behind the steering wheel. Are you still here with me? So when they saw Jesus performing miracles, they were not excited about salvation. They were excited about power. And sometimes we get excited about Jesus for the wrong reasons. Because we need something. We expect him to work for us. And the reality is Jesus did not come down here to fit our profile. Hallelujah. Jesus is Jesus, regardless of whether or not he fits into our puzzle. It wasn't that he had changed his mission. It wasn't that he had changed who he was meant to be. But they allowed their desperate dilemma to determine who Jesus was supposed to be. Are you still here with me? And because Jesus did not supply their need in the manner that they expected, their attitude towards Jesus was in danger of being compromised. But I've learned that Jesus does not have to meet our expectation to give us what we are expecting. Some of you missed that, so I need to say that again. Jesus does not have to meet our expectation in order to give us what we have been expecting. He is too big to limit himself to your expectation. But he can still bless you without meeting your expectation. Without meeting your profile. He is God all by himself. His ways are past finding out. His thoughts are above my thoughts. So he does not have to fit into any profile. He is God all by himself. Peter would have none of it. The Bible says Peter pulled Jesus aside because Jesus began talking about suffering. Peter didn't want any soft man. He wanted a king. So Jesus started talking about, I'm going to be suffering many things. And, and Peter could not reconcile this. You with so much power, you walked on water, you fed 5,000, and you talking about you're going to suffer. The Bible says Peter actually pulled Jesus aside and started to rebuke him if peter were a trinidadian you matter what you crazy we are here supporting you all this time and you're talking about suffering stop that nonsense eh? stop that right now no, I, I mean the bible says he he rebuked jesus stop that you matter what if these people hear you saying that, they will leave. They are here because they are longing for deliverance from these Roman scoundrels. And you're talking about suffering at the same hands of the same Romans? Shut up, Jesus. Don't you utter another word like that. I want you to understand how Peter felt because he was following Jesus with the hope that one day, Jews will be free. You see, the mistake they made is that they thought Jesus came to deliver Jews. But Jesus says, God so loved. 
somebody. God so loved the world. He did not come for SDAs. Oh Lord, have mercy. Some of you get mighty quiet here. He did not come for Mount Door SDAs. He came for the world. I, I said he came for the world. And the same means by which the world is going to be saved is the same means by which the church is going to be saved. What is that? I'm so glad you asked. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 8. By grace are you saved through faith, not by church attendance, lest any man should boast. Not by how early or how late or how often you are in church, but by God, lest any man should boast and tell you that they have never missed church. It's grace. Help me somebody. Amazing grace. He looks beyond our faults and sees our need. He did not come for the church. Oh, sorry, the church. He didn't come for the church. He came to save the world. I just wish more people would say amen this morning. He came to save the world. The reason why you are in church is because he came to save you while you were in the world. Could somebody say amen? He came to save the world. Hallelujah. Um, sometimes our circumstances change, cause us to change our opinion of Jesus. Isn't that true? Sometimes our circumstances make us philosophers. All of a sudden, we know what God is doing. And we advise others, I think I'm going through this because... And we try to make meaning of our circumstance, which is normal, which is human. But even our philosophizing does not determine who Jesus really is. Sometimes you just got to be still and know that he is God. Because you see, the truth is, there are some things that God does that you really cannot explain. And if God tries to explain it to you, you still won't understand anyway. So just have to accept that the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. But blessed be the name of the Lord my God. Do I have a witness here? The fact is, this is God doing it. Mm. Our circumstance make us change our opinions of Jesus, but not because our opinion of Jesus has changed, means that Jesus has changed. I'm going to say it again. Not because our opinion of Jesus has changed, means that Jesus has changed. Not because you say that Jesus does not care means he is uncaring. Not because you say he does not exist means he is not real. Not because you say he has abandoned you means he is not near you. Not because you say he hasn't answered you means he's not listening to you. Not because you don't feel his presence means he is not right there in the midst. Jesus, Jesus does not need our consensus to be who he says he is. Every two years in this church, we engage in an electoral process to get officers in place, in varied offices. But guess what? Jesus does not need our vote to get into any office. He can choose whichever office he wants to be, whenever he wants to be, however he chooses to be. He will be your healer today. He can be your deliverer tomorrow. He can bless you today and he can give you things tomorrow. He can lift you up today. He can bring you down tomorrow. He will still be God. He can do anything, anytime, anyhow, because he is God. They read the script, but they didn't understand the script because they were blinded by their dilemma. Remember those two guys on the way to Emmaus after the resurrection? 
When Jesus was in the midst and they began to discuss among themselves in Luke chapter 23, we thought he would have been the one to deliver Israel. We thought, we, we, we thought that he would have done that. And Jesus came by and said, what are you all discussing there? Haven't you guys read? They read the script, but they didn't understand the script. You have to be careful when people tell you, I think. Am I talking to anybody here today? You got to be careful, especially when some seasoned Seventh-day Adventist leader comes and tells you, I think you are going through this because sometimes you have to know who to talk to when you're going through difficult times. There are some people you should not speak to when you're going through difficult times. They are too much of a philosophers when you're going through difficult times. I don't know about you, but I must tell Jesus, all of my trials, I cannot bear my burdens alone. I can't talk to everybody, and I can't talk to anybody, but I can talk to Jesus anytime, anywhere. His lines are always open, and he will answer when I call. Do I have a witness here? This is the God I serve. Oh. Ha. Ha. He's an awesome God. Don't limit yourself. You can listen to others, but don't let others determine what's going on in your life. There are some people who come to you and tell you, by now you should stop crying. By now you should be over that. Six months have gone, six years, and he's still crying. Just tell them kindly, mind your... Because you don't know what I have been through. You don't know what I've been through. Don't let people dry your tears. You keep on dry. You keep on weeping. I, last time I checked, Jesus did not say the brethren will dry your tears. He said, I will dry your tears. Don't let anybody stop you from crying out to him, even when you don't understand it. Don't let anybody determine that. The prophet Isaiah, when he was prophesying, did say that his coming was not without an enigma. Stay with me now. Isaiah, in prophesying, yes, you keep crying. God will dry your tears. She stopped crying already, you know. <laughs> oh, Father, have mercy. Oh, Lord. Boy, do I know about that. Sometimes they cry. And Sinead, anyhow. Um... The, um, <laughs> Isaiah chapter 9 verse 6 verse 6 speaks about the enigma that this Jesus would have posed and if they had read the script they would have understood he was going to be different from any other person he says unto us a child is born unto us a son is given you read the text brother Alan you read the text unto us a child is born unto us a son is is given. Listen to the text. Unto us a child is born, but the son is not born. The son is given. Right in that verse there, it speaks about the, the humanity and the divinity of Jesus. Are you still here with me? That the child is born because humans are born. But not because you are born a child means you become a son. Sonship is a gift. Oh, Lord, have mercy. I lost some of you right there. You see, in other words, his child, his being born a child, depicted his humanity. But then he's also a son, gifted by his father, which tells me that while he was going to be human, he was going to operate on a divine level. He is the only God that could become man and still remain God while existing as man. Mm -hmm. And he was all of God while all of man. I can't understand it, but it's God, so I don't need to explain it. I just have to accept it because he says without faith, it's impossible to please him. If I come to him, I must believe that he is and he says what he is and he is what he says. And he's going to be a son that is given. Which means he is going to be human, but operating on a divine level. So what you see him doing 
humanly was to depict who he was heavenly. Stay with me now. Mm -hmm. So if he is walking on water, humanly, he doesn't want you to walk on water. He wants you to walk on water spiritually. To let you know that the thing in which you should be sinking, you can walk on top of it. Uh -huh. Are you still here with me? That thing in which you are drowning, he can give you the power to walk on top of it. Are you still here with me? Uh, so what you see him doing physically was to depict who he is spiritually. That's why he turned and rebuked Peter and said, Satan, don't you dare point your finger at me. Get behind me. Because you save rest the things of man and not of God. Mm -hmm. I came to operate on a divine level. But you are trying to keep me on a humanistic level. Get thee behind me, Satan. And many of you may need to say that even to your friends. You taking that? Eh? After what you do, you, you taking that? If I were you. I will give you a piece of my mind. Because in your mind, you have to get back at the Romans, I mean at the friend. Oh, you're not listening to me, church. You not taking that. And there are people who try to incite rivalry. And they might be justified in thinking that you did no wrong. Why are you allowing that person to walk all over you? But there's something about knowing Jesus. There are some things you can't do the way you used to do it. In other words, if I were to take God out of my thoughts, <laughs> that person gone through. But I've gotten to know so much about God that I can't treat you the way you want me or expect me to treat you. I am so amazed at my own life that long ago I would have lost my temper a long time. But God is keeping me because I am not walking as man, but I'm walking as God. This proves that sonship is not biological. Neither is it hereditary or contagious. You don't become a son of God by association. No, no, no. I don't care how long you have been in his presence or how long you have been in the presence of those who are sons and daughters of God. You don't become a child of God by association. Well, pastor, how do I become? I'm so glad you asked. John chapter 1 verse 12. As many as receive him, to them he gave the authority to become sons of God. You got to receive him. You got to receive him. And when you receive him, you won't lash out the way you used to. Because you receive him. What happens to us biologically is meant to depict some greater lesson spiritually. Let me illustrate this. Those of you who have children, you know how the children resemble you. And they behave like you. Yes, I know you're going to keep quiet. Sometimes, as parents, we get upset when we see traits in our child. And the traits that upset us most are those that resemble the ones we have. Let me go on this side because some of you are very high and holy. But for those of you who don't have children, I am warning you, the traits that will make you most upset are the ones that you have. It's you who give the child the DNA. It's your fault. If you had gotten rid of it, then you couldn't pass it on. Well, let me go on back on this side here. Yeah? Because this side, look, people looking at me serious here. But the fact of the matter is, some of you know that I think I have two children. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. My child resembles me. The other one resembles Stacy. <laughs> so, some of you take it too long to get this. <laughs> uh, uh, yes, yes. One resembles the mother, the other resembles the father. Uh, and so you have no doubt as to who is my child. <laughs> 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 
Because there are some things in that child which resemble the father. And I'm telling you, what happens to us biologically is to depict a greater lesson spiritually. I ought to know if you are a child of God. Because it's supposed to resemble him. Oh Lord have mercy. You're supposed to resemble who your father is. I shouldn't have to guess. By the way you walk, I must see daddy. By the way you talk, I must see your father. By the way you behave, I must see your father. I must know that you're a child of God. You don't have to walk with a badge or a monogram. You just have to live. You just have to open your mouth. And I must know that you are a child of God. Because his DNA must run through your vein. He that had the son had life. And people who know God are never boring. I didn't get enough amen for that one. People who have God have life. And when you have life, you can't be boring. So if you are aligning with somebody who is boring, that person dead. <laughs> get somebody who has life. If ladies, if you meet a boyfriend and he can't talk too much about Jesus, it makes him upset. Just pack your bags. Thank you for the time. I'm moving on because I don't want a guy who can't talk about Jesus. Let me see if I can amen for the guys too. Men, if you meet a woman Who only want to party and go out and can't sit well in church. And when they come to church, you, you, you look down, you, you only see flesh. You look up, you're seeing flesh. The clothes is moving closer to each other. And they can't focus. They always want to touch you and be touched by you in church. You make sure you sit in the back so that nobody could see you when you are handsy pansy in the back. Uh, when that happens, you've got to pack up your bags and say, no, I've got to move on. Where are the men? Men you say amen in this church. You all like the handy, you all like the handsy pie. Oh, oh, sorry, sorry. It's the wrong congregation. Sorry. I do apologize. I do, I do apologize. Father, have mercy upon this congregation. Oh, Father, I'm trying to instruct them, but I don't want the instruction. But uh, let's move on. And, uh, and I'm coming to a close. Uh, but then Isaiah employs a very interesting word in describing Jesus which the Jews should not have missed, is the word wonderful. His name shall be called wonderful because he shall be full of wonder. Mm. I looked up the word wonder because I was curious to find out what this means. You see, we have used it loosely and sometimes synonymously with the word beautiful and pretty. But that's not the understanding of the word wonderful. It has a lot to do with awe. It, it speaks about something so amazing that you can't do anything but wonder. Mm. Mm. It means Jesus' impact upon the world will be so amazing that it would defy explanation. Mm -hmm. It will be miraculous and marvelous. It means, therefore, that Jesus cannot be confined to a definition. Stay with me now. Jesus cannot be confined to a definition because once you have a definition, then you would not wonder. Why? Because a definition, by definition, confines that which it defines. Mm -hmm. I hope I'm not going too fast. A definition confines that which it defines. Whenever you give an object a description, you put that object in a box that limits it to its description. Mm -hmm. So whenever you see the label on the outside of the box, you know the limitations of that box. If you are going to paint your house and it says oil paint, you know what oil paint is for and you know what water paint is for. You won't try to confuse the two. Are you still here with me? Well, Jesus always operates outside of the box. Therefore, you cannot describe him. He warns you, 
Don't even try to write a research paper on me. What do you mean? Who by searching or researching can find out God? What kind of description would you give to God? And if I were to ask each of you to give me your own description of God, you will define him based on your circumstance. Yes, yes. And you will define him based on your limitation. And the reality is, all of us will be right. We will be accurate, but not adequate. Because all of our definitions of God still limits who God is. Because you see, it's just a definition. But when you talk about wonder, oh Lord have mercy. When you talk about wonderful, it means God can fit into any description, any time, and he can change any time. So one day, he might be the lily of the valley. The next time, he might be a bright and morning star. He might be your master and your servant at the same time. He is the root and he is the offspring. In other words, he is the father of David, but also the son of David at the same time. How do you explain that? Jesus. Jesus. But then the word for wonder speaks about difficulty, and which is understandable. It's the same word that I believe Jeremiah employed in Jeremiah chapter 32, where he says, Is anything too hard for God? In other words, is anything too full of wonder for me not to perform? This excites me, brothers and sisters, because it tells me. God is a God who likes to do wonderful things. Oh, Lord, have mercy. And our faith limits him to the ordinary things. So that's why he puts your back up against the wall and makes sure that you can't know how to find it out. So that if ever an answer comes, you know it's an act of wonder. Come on, talk to me, somebody. Some of you have husbands or spouses that you know you of yourself could not find. Don't say amen. Just nod and pretend you don't know what I'm talking about. No, I put out my application form and I got what I wanted, Pastor. I don't know what you're talking about. That happens to others. But the fact of the matter is God blesses us even more than we can ask or imagine. That's how wonderful he is. Because he will do things that will baffle our mind. And I want you to try him today. I want you to not limit God by your circumstance. Wondering how you can get out. Talk to the one who is full of wonder. Lord, you allowed me to get in to this. Now get me out of this. I don't know how you can do it, but I know you can do it. You are able. You are, I've done it before, and you are the same God yesterday, today, and forever. Come on, God. Deliver me and bless me. Now when I put the two words together, I get wonder. I get difficulty. It also speaks about miracle. Wow. Miracle. So in the same wonder, there is miracle and there is difficulty. And the truth of the matter is, we might see the difficulty in the miracle happening. God sees the miracle in the difficulty. Jesus, Lord, have mercy. I'm going to say it again. We, with our mortal eyes, see the difficulty in how this is going to happen. God says, no, reverse it. I see the miracle in the difficulty. I see the miracle in your circumstance because I am a God of wonder. That's why, don't question me, Peter. I would suffer many things, but I'm still going to be the Messiah. Didn't Isaiah ask the rhetorical question, who shall believe our report? And to whom shall the arm of the Lord be revealed. Are you still here? I'm closing up now, no worry. Just a few more hours and I'll be done. <laughs> Who shall believe our report? Get this, get this. This is the most important part of this message, so please wake up. Wake up if you're sleeping. Who shall believe our report? To whom is the arm 
of the Lord revealed. And the arm of the Lord was revealed by taking licks. Because the arm was wounded, the same chapter, for our transgression. The arm was bruised for our iniquity. The arm was mocked and scorned and rejected. This is how the arm of the Lord, the power of God, is revealed in suffering. And Lord, what paradox is this? How can you reveal your power when you're getting licked? Well, I have discovered that one of the tests of a person who is powerful is one who knows that he has the power, but he does not use it to his own advantage. I know I can hit back at you. I can just call the prime minister's office. I can just call the pastor's office. I can get you out of office, but I would not use my power. Jesus didn't have to call any father. He could have just said the word and nails would have come out of his hands. But he allowed himself because he knows how much power he has. And that's the power he is giving to us today. So that we are not without excuse or not with excuse by saying, I, I can't love that woman now. Mm -mm. I can't love she for what she did. I can't forgive she for what she did. Jesus gives you that power to tell you, love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. Do good to them that despitefully use you. That's when you have power. Because the enemy expects you to give up when you are being whipped. He expected Jesus to retaliate. Let me tell you something. The enemy knew that he had lost or he was losing. So he was trying to provoke Jesus on the cross. He said, hey, look at him now. Yeah, look at him now. He saved others, but he can't even save himself. He was trying to provoke the poor man because he knew he had lost the battle. I learned just this week uh, that Golgotha the, the, the place of the skull. Do you know why they call it the place of the skull? It's a place of the skull because Golgotha is in the shape of a skull. And I asked myself, Jesus, why are you climbing up a place of the skull? And he says, Steve, you didn't read the memo. Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. I announced my first promise to the devil. And I say, I will put enmity between thee and the woman. And between thy seed and her seed, I'll make sure her seed crush your skull. Help me somebody. Stay with me now. I'll make sure that her seed will crush your skull. So it's not by chance he is climbing up to the top, the top of the skull. And the devil would have won the battle if he had pong the nails into the hands of Jesus and pong the nails into the feet of Jesus and left him there to die and to rot. He would have won the battle but the mistake he made was when he lifted up the cross when he lifted up the cross because then Jesus reminded him and I, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me Hallelujah! Somebody says that at that point, the cross became an inverted spear that went through the skull of the enemy. I have declared here today that Jesus won the battle when the devil used the cross to get rid of Jesus. Jesus used the cross to get rid of Satan. So there is power in suffering. Now I could understand. Now I could understand why David went to Goliath and took out his sword and cut off his head. Simple method. He said, David, why he did that? He said, I was representing my son and my father, Jesus. I, I represented him. Why? You see, the same sword that the enemy brought to get rid of me. I will use it to get rid of him. Come, 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 Samson. Come, come by here and testify. What is your testimony? My testimony is the same temple they use to mock me 
is the same temple that crushed them. <laughs> come, 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 come by here, Mordecai. Tell me, what is your testimony? Well, the same gallows that Haman used to get rid of me is the same gallows that was used to get rid of Haman. Come by here, Jesus. Testify. Well, the same cross that the devil used to get rid of me is the same cross I used to get rid of him. Hallelujah. That's why there's power in not retaliating. I don't have to get my rights to win this battle. I just have to be still and know that he is God. He will do it. So Peter, don't allow Satan to provoke you anymore. There is power. Sometimes you've got to suffer in order to win. Sometimes you've got to be demoted in order to win. Sometimes people have to dislike you to teach you how to like them. Oh, Lord, have mercy. And some of you don't want to hear this message. Don't want to hear this message. Sometimes God wants you to see how much love your heart has if you're loving as Gentiles who don't know me. Because Gentiles only love when they are loved. But if you want to be perfect as I am perfect, then you have to learn to love even when you are not being loved. So I sometimes put those people in your path to hate you, to teach you how to love them in spite of their hatred. For the battle is won when you love as I love. When you do things as I did it. When you live as I live, that's when the battle is won. Anybody ready here? <laughs> to go up to Golgotha. It's a very grueling and cruel journey. But that's where the battle is won. We don't have to worry about whether or not we would win because we have already won. They tell me that whenever a bee stings you, it dies not long after. Yes, that's true. 2,000 years ago, that bee stung Jesus. And Jesus is the one who's alive. And the bees' days are numbered. Oh, Lord have mercy. Satan stung him on the cross, expecting him to die. As if to say, like how so many do today, if I don't get, if, I, if I'm going, you have to go with me. The devil knows he was going. He just wanted Jesus to go with him. But he made a mistake. Jesus had so much power. That even when he did not exercise his power, he was still more powerful. I don't have time. I don't have time. You, you guys, do, I don't have time. There's so much I wanted to share with you. But I'm just limited. I'm just leave, leave, leaving that with you. Help me, Jesus. I'm just leaving that with you to let you know that God's power is not limited to what he does. It's also, it also involves what he does not do. So he may not deliver you, but don't you dare believe you don't have power. Because even if he doesn't come through for you, you still have power to win. <laughs>